So, a little bit of entertainment for the beginning. Ah, it is. Yeah. Okay, so it was, you know, I've been asked uh, about history of that, uh, how it was developing said so many times that I decided to just to have this very short uh, excursion to the States. Yes. Okay. A little bit too illustration. And... Uh, okay, that's what I meant. Okay, this is the... Uh, some place in uh, Russia, it's north of the Russia, it's really very north of Russia, so you know, America calls these kind of places like deep country. And, uh, it's about 500 kilometers from the St. Petersburg, and that's what we actually doing there in summer vacations uh, for many, many, many years. And you can see uh, how long it is, because you see that this... Uh, did not, is there a pointer here somewhere, no? no okay. Uh, so uh, you see that boat, and there is a small guy there uh, who doesn't want to give the spinning to my wife. And uh, this is the guy from the left, so you can imagine for how many years we uh, cover this territory every, every um, uh, summer and autumn. And uh, you see, somehow we are armed, you know, with the guns. It's hunting guns. It's not because of there are a lot of bears. There are a lot of bears, but it is for, you know, even more um, important uh, situation, uh, just for food. Because if you love the deep country, you should love absence of uh, supermarkets. And very often the question of... Uh, uh, food, uh, it's in your hands. So that's why we, you know, really had uh, some, you see, um, hunting, etc., etc., just for the, uh, you know, for the life. Check, okay. Okay. So now we are coming to... Okay, that is the part, right? Well, that's strange, okay. Okay, so that the... First, of course, when you deal with the nanocrystals, nanoparticles, quantum dots, etc., etc., uh, you should make them. And uh, you know the history of uh, color glass comes to the beginning of millennia, I think, because that uh, uh, cathedrals, uh, which you see in uh, France, I was surprised what they will build, will build it up at first century of the last millennia. And it is a very, very beautiful stained glasses. And this is actually uh, glasses like we have, just they use not nanocrystals, they use just uh, railroads for the coloring of that uh, materials. And uh, really I was surprised to see that it was so, so, so long ago, and the question is how they have measured the temperature a thousand years ago, uh, how they measure the weight, because it sometimes it's just grams, uh, no, it, at least for laboratory, that it was so, so, so long ago, and the question is how they have measured the temperature a thousand years ago, uh, how they measure the weight, because it sometimes it's just grams, uh, no, it, at least for laboratory needs. And uh, so sometimes you can see, the okay, maybe it's aliens now, it's sort of very fashionable, if uh, difficult to imagine that they mm, be made by human beings. Okay, the answer is simple. Okay, that's uh, aliens. But of course not, it is just uh, doable by humans, and that's what we will mm, try to do now. I mean, I will try to show you how, how it was done. Okay, I see this. Okay, and uh, actually, the, I was trying to find some recipe from that time, or nothing. I mean, nothing. <laughs> and so, uh, when we started to do uh, this uh, job, you know, I mean, chemical job to grow the particles, we found that it's not that simple because there are 
many parameters which should be controlled just to regulate size. And uh, when we had these troubles, uh, I mean that many, many results, many, many objects, different colors, but it's not seen how uh, it depends on the para on duration of annealing, on temperature of annealing, on concentration, and so many parameters. It's difficult to find the uh, way how to control this. And uh, occasionally, some important things sometimes happens occasionally, and the um, chief of our department in the institution of uh, State Optical Institute, it was just a routine uh, visit to the lab, and uh, I asked him, what, what, what do you think? It's a lot of results, but we don't have any idea how to um, you know, align them to get some understanding. And he said, okay, I remember it was about maybe 50 years ago, uh, it was some theoretical uh, publication uh, which was named um, uh, Phase Decomposition of Oversaturated Solid Solutions of Metals. So that is, yes, the efforts here. You see it is, uh, okay, it was uh, published in uh, 1958, I think, but uh, the work was done in 1945 during the Second World War, and I was surprised with what's strange here. Yeah? And uh, when I met the author, that uh, Slozov, uh, he told me, yeah, it was a uh, job uh, aimed to, um, to make alloys for the tanks. That's why it was original. That was was motivation uh, to uh, for this work to make in the during the uh, Second World War. So and uh, he said, "Okay, have a look. It would be uh, a few decades uh, out there for the paper." And he, of course, it leaves us this, uh, maybe you know that uh, um, set of the theoretical physics handbooks. Landau and Lifshitz. So in the third volume, it was actually um, described that theory, that's why I'll start to show you. Uh, so we have, okay, is there a pointer, no? Uh -huh. you know, it's just light, right? Up one, okay. Uh, So this actually, the slide shows the kinetics of the growth of the nanocrystals in the process of phase decomposition of solution, oversaturated solution. And you can see that, as I mentioned, it depends on uh, temperature. So there are a set of different temperatures. Let me check it. Yes, it works. So in this case, it is from 550 to 770 Celsius. And, uh, also, it is dependence on uh, duration time. So you put the sample in the furnace, you adjust temperature, and you wait some different periods of the times, and you will have these experimental points. And you see that when it is the low temperature, so in this um, particular case, for this material, it's cut sulfide, uh, 550 Celsius, that at the beginning, the particles did not uh, change the size. And the next temperature, there is also flat dependence. So all the particles during the annealing at the proper temperature and the proper uh, duration stay the, with the same size, but the number of particles increases. So that's a process called nucleation and uh, ostal triping. And, uh, the check by absorption, um, uh, by absorption technique, optical absorption, you can uh, control the amount of the particles because the more the particles, the more light they absorb, and you have some specific absorption spectrum, which uh, intensity of which increases just uh, this. Oops, no, 
this one. Just uh, this time and at the high temperature this, but uh, number of particles increases and that we see it by absorption. And this is the nucleation and I just would like you to pay attention that smallest size is about one nanometer. Uh, oh, see that is the scale, uh, scale. So it's one nanometer, two nanometers, etc. So you can start from very, very low sizes. And this is solid, reliable thermodynamic process. Particles have the spherical shape. It's just nature problem because of the surface tension to have the spherical shape. And uh, it's just nothing to do. I mean, just have the right temperature and the right duration. And there is actually the theorist was so kind, we were so kind that they made the formula. And you see the formula with the, some parameters which you find in literature. And you, OK, I would like the particles of this size. You just put it in the formula, and you will see, OK, this temperature, this duration of the process. It's a very rare situation when the you know, theory helps you what to do to get result which you want to have. OK, so after that, there is a um, second stage. So you see that it is uh, uh, some growth of the size particles. And of course, again, it's a growth of the number of particles and the concentration. So in the absorption spectra, you can see it. And the third stage, and this actually, the particles grow at the expense of the material which dissolves us. Uh, molecules of, uh, of, in case it's cut sulfide, they just uh, join each other and they have to give the nanocrystal and uh, uh, the size of the nanocrystal increases with time. So you see, and you uh, go like uh, 100, 10 nanometers, no, and even more. Even more, you have the theory said that uh, this process will stop when all the material will be the just one big particles. And that after that, so there is no, no progress. But we never had it, I don't know, because you see, even in this case, it is like hundreds of hours we have the last time. And so hundreds of hours is five, uh, how to say, five days. Uh, and that's uh, so the stage which is second stage. So is it uh, written here? It is three stages of phase decomposition of uh, oversaturated solution. And the last stage, uh, it is uh, the growth of the particles at the expense of dissolution of smaller ones. So when the um, size increases, concentrations of uh, initial material in, uh, in decreases. And that's why that uh, the particles, bigger particles, start to grow at the expense of the dissolution of smaller ones. That's why the final result of this uh, process is one big particle. OK, so let's have a look what will be after that. Oops. Uh -huh. And here it will be just to say, oops. OK. And here it's again theory. Uh, I just, maybe it's a privilege of our institutions. It was Joffe, Abraham Fyodor Joffe. It's well known in the initial uh, physics of semiconductors. He was actually one of the first guys who, it was just at the beginning of the century. Um, so uh, we have in our head, and I uh, know that they have, uh, they have now institution. It's a group about you know, 20 to 30 theorists. And if you interested in you know some stellar growth, etc., you can find the guy who worked in this uh, field. So the next step you, you do, okay, I have this result. It's solid result. Of course, you should have some experimental results, and you start to look for theorists. And that's what I did. And the theorists, which I decided, it's okay. Uh, 
uh, he's reliable, he's smart, and he's really very, very you know, polite, etc. So I just um, spoke with the brother of Alexander Efforts, older brother, and uh, told him the story, and he said, okay, um, I will do it. So let's, I meet you in a couple of weeks. I will read all that and I need to read, etc., etc. And in a couple of weeks, uh, the uh, Alexei and uh, some young guy, uh, you see, he it is, looks like very tall. It's not like this, it is, you know, but he's on something, some pedestal. He's here also, you will see it. <coughs> And uh, so they came both, and he said, okay, have a look, it's my brother, he also a theorist, young theorist, and he will walk with you. And so we started to walk, and uh, very soon uh, we moved actually in our apartment, because we were leaving the building houses in Leningrad, but it happened that just we, I could see his windows from my windows and vice versa. And just, you know, a few hundred meters. Having mind that to go to the institution, it takes um, 40 minutes by tram. So very soon we decided that there is no need to waste time by going to the tram. So we walked at home. And this again, it's Academy of Sciences. Uh, you know, everybody, in some sense, can do what he needs to do. Not like, okay, oh, it's time I should rush, etc. No way. It's again it's the uh, feature of Academy of Science even Academy, which we, you know, uh, Academy of Sciences of USSR, it was. Okay, so let's come. The question about theory. So it's time to have some theory how that uh, uh, particles work, how they should uh, be. Uh, should it be ne necessary crystalline structure or maybe there's just amorphous small particles will work as a quantum object and uh, shape is uh, necessary to be spherical, etc. So it's a lot of questions and we didn't know anything about the particles. So what we see as a sample has some color. If that uh, after some long time on annealing becomes uh, um, say, whitish, this means that particles grow and it's just scattering of light, so we say, okay, this is uh, two big particles. If there is transparent, transparent, a trans uh, little bit translucent, translucent, so we say, okay, the particles are small enough, and the color is different. And we know, okay, that it was a sample which was in Nilton for five hours, and uh, it is more translucent than the sample in Nilton, hundreds of hours. So we know that uh, temperature, and duration, the growth, the size, and we could measure this size uh, by, uh, it is, should be here, okay, it, uh, yeah, uh, measured by um, small angle X-ray scattering technique. We didn't have this technique in, this, in our uh, laboratory, in the institution, so uh, we just how they made the collaboration with the another institution, and they measure the uh, uh, size and crystalline structure uh, with the, this technique. And you see, just you know, this is uh, uh, can, this is the piece of glass, and these are particles of different size, quantum dots, and this uh, just one of the ones that's covered by the image of high resolution transmission electron microscope. And so you see that this is first crystalline structure, no doubt just for this. Even we know that this is, for example, Wurzite crystalline structure, and uh, for this you know, material it could be different crystalline structure for different materials. And uh, the size is certainly, uh, the shape is certainly spherical. So. And if it is written in the upper uh, field, the theory, I mean, Alexei and Alexander Efron, they assumed that crystallines are, uh, the particles has crystalline structure, and actually it is necessary because only uh, crystalline structure can provide you the uh, masses that electrons moves inside of that glass. 
and they have must, which is not uh, uh, fit to the uh, just uh, electron in that, uh, you know, in the vacuum, for example, right? So that's called effective mass approximation. And again, each particle depends on the, each um, the approximation depends on the material. It's different because it depends strongly on the uh, structure of the valence band. So what we will see here. Okay, and also what was not uh, should be taken into account it's uh, um, Coulomb interaction because when the material absorb light, photon, it gives the energy to the hole in the uh, valence band or somewhere here, right? And the electrons goes up and becomes to be in the uh, conduction band and the hole stay there. So these two particles, they are positive and negative charge, they have the Coulomb interaction. And uh, that's, is, uh, the result is it's a, qua a new quasi-particle, and the uh, scientists who in, uh, introduced in the physics this uh, phenomena, actually exciton, uh, was uh, Evgeny Gross, and it was at the, um, I think a few, one decade after the Second World War, and he got some, what at that time was Stalin Prize for the Finding of the exciton, and um, yeah, and so this should be taken into account. And in this case, we have in the um, our particles inside, we have the uh, electron, which one after absorption of light, after elimination of light, and we have uh, excitons. And that exciton, depending on the material, they may have different uh, uh, size. But here you see that uh, material uh, copper chloride, so the radius of the particles of the excitons is eight angstrom. And uh, uh, particles of cut sulfide has 30 angstrom. It is radius in this case, right? And the case of so-called strong confinement, which cuts selenite, and the radius of exciton, 60 angstroms, and this is given by nature, so that it depends and determined by material. So if you will go to 235, it can be a few hundreds, exciton uh, uh, size, etc. So every material, each material had the... Um, uh, the, the, its uh, own size. And we will have a look for just two uh, cases, so it will be weak confinement and intermediate confinement. And uh, uh, this case actually, no, I will show in the next one, but the formula is actually very simple. I mean, you see that is here, which uh, gives you the... Uh, second. Yeah, uh, that is uh, energy of the particles as a function of size. We have the size again, so that uh, here we have the root of a Bessel function, just, just numbers here, here this H, and here there is mass of exciton, and here there is radius. Right? Okay, and when we go to the next, so here you see, again, it was mentioned, it is true, that mostly the physics was done of the nanocrystals, at, at least at the first stages, just by optical spectroscopy. So it's absorption, luminescence, and uh, Raman scattering, also informative approach to the study of the particles. We will, you know, touch it also. And so what we see, and what we see next week, figure, I give you that structure of energy spectrum. So this is a conduction band, well, a conduction band, and you see there is some mass of uh, uh, electron is shown here. This is forbidden gap of the semiconductor, and we see that in this material the 
valence band is split. So in uh, not one band we have here, we have one, two, three. And this is what's so called that uh, spin orbit splitting. And uh, in some case, the material of copper chloride it should be written somewhere, but for sure it's copper chloride, I remember. Uh, mm, the material had a little bit abnormal because normally it's this couple of bands should be above and this bed will be below. And uh, that's why, uh, the, you know, as I mentioned, the theory needs your spherical shape, crystalline structure, and non-degenerated valence band. So this is non-degenerated valence band, and these two, they are degenerate. So that, uh, you should take into account both of them at the calculations, uh, having in mind that they have different uh, mass. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, it was demand of the theory, and that's why some people uh, ask why you started from that material which is not, uh, it's uh, ultraviolet, you do, does this because absorption is uh, at, um, more than three electron volts, so you don't see any color, etc. It was shown because this is unique material which has the upper band is uh, non-degenerate, so just fit to the theory, it is crystalline. That's why you may use approach of um, uh, approximation, uh, effective mass approximation, and you have the shape, as I shown you, and you have band which is non-degenerate, so you, when you will deal, deal with that transition, so absorb plate, electrons go up, excitons here, and there is uh, electro uh, holes here, and uh, excitons move, they have uh, through the lattice, and uh, they have mass, so you use this formula, which is, like, let me say, Z12, it should be, okay, Z, also 1, 2, uh, okay. So you, you start to measure this line, spectral position, and you, of course, compare it with the bulk samples. I mean, just normal material of the um, millimeters, whatever. Right? So absorption spectra will look like this, and the two characteristic parameters, uh, spectral position of this line, Z3, which comes from this transition, and the position, spectral position of uh, the another line, which actually origin from that uh, transition, absorption in that uh, from the lower level. And uh, these two values fit perfectly with the bulk material. And here there is uh, size, I think, 300 uh, nanometers, yeah, 310. So from optics, we can say, okay, there is a bulk normal material, everybody knows the structure, etc., etc. But particles 300 nanometers radius, which is uh, quite small, but it's not quantum dose, that's what we uh, call nanocrystals. Nanocrystals are just a little bit down, uh, 10 times down to the, from the microcrystals. And uh, we see that with the decrease of the size, so it is size, it is here, yes, 310, that red one, about 30 angstrom, so this is the spectrum. Spectrum and spectrum is the same. I mean, there are two lines, but you see that they shift significantly, and also they have some uh, difference in the uh, speed of the moving. Again, here is the energy, oh, wave length is color, what position, uh, and the scale, which is measured here in the electron volts, uh, just energy, <coughs> uh, depends on the um, size. And that was actually quantum size effect. So you can see it just by having the sample, and you see, okay, this is uh, nanocrystal, and if it is uh, somewhere here, if it is like um, 20, 29, um, I think up to 100, it is still transparent material which uh, shows you the spectra as it was in bulk, just 
shifted uh, uh, from the point of view of wavelengths or energy uh, to the higher uh, energies just because of size. And that fits with the... Uh, uh, ah, here, 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 uh, here. And that fits with the uh, theory which I saw that's very simple, just... Uh, 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 just arithmetics, because there is formula, it looks like there are many parameters, but the only one is important. Everything is fixed, because this is uh, mass electrons, <coughs> mass holes, so this one masses, with number which are known for the, these levels. And so from the slope of that curve, you can find the mass, just from this simple formula, the mass of... Um, uh, that band, and it is known, and it is uh, uh, what we found, it fit again with the bulk value. And the masses of this and this sum band was not known, and so we have this curve, which has a little bit different uh, slope, and uh, the formula is actually the same, <coughs> almost the same, but com more complicated, right? So, and we can calculate, and that's what the first result which, you know, theorist uh, gave us. Okay, you didn't know this values, this and this of the mass of holes. We said, no. Okay, that's what I hear. That is... Uh, <laughs> okay, so we have this mass, 2.6 for this one, this band. And the mass 1.5, it is for the uh, dead bands. So that the first was we <coughs> got at the second confirmation that this is just normal, usual material which uh, demonstrate usual spectra will be the, we'll see the same for the uh, Raman spectra, Raman scattering spectra. Uh, just there is some. Uh, energy dependence on size. So the first what we saw is that the position, the energy of the transition doesn't matter. Is it absorption? Is it luminescence? Is it uh, scattering uh, with the optical phonons, with the acoustic phonons? It's just the same spectra, the same physics of the optical transitions which we see. Because what we see, we just see uh, uh, that energy between uh, you know, this value and this value. And again, it's what the confirmation, the second publication, I think, or maybe third one, uh, mm, which confirmed, yes, there is still material which we know as a bulk. And just the uh, values of uh, these masses for that say, can be uh, determined from experiment. But again, this is see that, okay, material is the same. The change of the uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so let's uh, go further. It's just the time to go further, and I will push the. Oops. Okay, so as I promised, we will touch the uh, uh, Raman scattering. In this case, it's resonant Raman scattering. And uh, you see here. Up Absorption spectra, 10 minutes. Sorry? It's time for it. Okay, time is always for it, right? <laughs> no, okay, so what we see here, that's the absorption spectra of the samples of another sample, cat selenide. Right now? You know, when I watched that, uh, you know, the uh, movies from the 2022, it was some uh, red line which, you know, increased so I could see, okay, there is some 10 minutes, 5 minutes, etc. That's okay. Uh, okay, so again, what I just to tell you that we should... Uh, okay, that... Oops. This is another material. Okay, so this is uh, 
Raman scattering light, so there's 200 uh, uh, reciprocal centimeters. And again, we see that position of this light depends on size. And uh, when we put the, the function of uh, um, uh, size, which is actually 2 pi divided by radius, you see this uh, curve, which is again the typical normal curve of uh, dispersion of the uh, energy of the optical phonon in this case and uh, that's you know and we have that again the shape of uh, how that curve looks it is typical dependence for the bulk materials we again say that despite of the small sizes we yes we see something uh, that uh, happens with the decrease of the size but it is still material known material which has uh, properties, optical, etc., etc., uh, which comes from the bulk materials, just a little bit changed by the side of the particles. Okay, so I, I wouldn't, I've been pushed to finish here. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Yakimov for this um, insight, historic insight in how quantum dots were discovered first in glass. The discovery that it is possible to create quantum dots using solution chemistry was made by Professor Louis Bruce, who was born in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, received his PhD in 1969 from Columbia University, where he's now a professor. Uh, please welcome on stage for his Nobel lecture, Professor Louis Bruce. Okay. Well, I want to thank the Nobel Foundation for the great, great honor of this uh, prize and allowing me to talk this morning. Um, a few mistakes creep into the slides, wrong date and so forth. I gotta go back, okay. Um, okay.
So I'd like to talk about chemical quantum dots and our effort to make, um, under, <clears throat> to create these things in solution that will typically in, be involving cadmium, cadmium selenide. I'm pushing the wrong button here. Cadm oops, backwards one more time. Yeah, cadmium selenide. Uh, two, two six semiconductor. The uh, red balls are selenium atoms. The small ones, blue ones, are cadmium cadmium atoms or ions. It's a tetrahedral material. Each each um, blue ball is surrounded by four red ones, and each red one surrounded by four blue ones. And <clears throat> I'll use, uh, also talk some about short uh, carbon nanotubes as in order to contrast their behavior to the uh, nanocrystals. So here's a slide showing nature's, on the left-hand side, biological nanoscience. Uh, starting with macroscopic objects coming down in size all the way to uh, proteins. And proteins are about the same size as nanocrystals here or carbon nanotubes. This might be 35 angstroms in diameter. This one might be uh, 10 angstroms in diameter. This is carbon 60 or buckleball, buckyball. It was awarded the Nobel Prize some years ago. Rick Smalley and his, and his collaborators. You can see the DNA over here, maybe 10 angstroms, 20 angstroms in diameter, roughly the same as a larger carbon nanotube. So the quantum dots, the colloidal quantum dots, began when I was a staff scientist in at t Bell Labs in the late 1982 first observations. Um, this Bell Laboratories was the uh, research and development laboratory of the telephone monopoly in the United States. And they were mainly concerned with uh, the science, science that would support things that were critical in communications. New materials, uh, mathematics of, trans of, of, phone, of the phone, of phone system, and computer chips. And I want to thank the leadership of Bell Labs for supporting this research in its earliest stages, uh, long before it was recognized as important by the academic community in the United States. So let's begin with what is a semiconductor nanocrystal? As Alexei was describing, it's a small piece of rock. In this case, it might be 30 angstroms in diameter, maybe 10 atoms across from one side to the other. And if uh, down here, you can see that it, maybe there are 40% of the atoms are actually on the surface. Um, made by chemical synthesis, I don't need to describe this right now, but creating a colloid that has this 30 angstrom diameter particle with ligands on the surface, ligands to give stability and functionality, as you'll, as you'll see in, in a minute. I'd like to convince you this really is a branch of chemistry. And so I show you uh, the apparatus, you know, for making quantum dots of a certain size. This is a photograph taken in my laboratory. A three-necked flask. Thermocouple coming in one side, maybe 15 or 20 cc's of solvent on the bottom, a stirring bar, and a septum for injection of chemicals, heating mantle to heat up the, heat up the solvent. Um, so in this situation, we can adjust the temperature and we can initiate the reaction either by injection through the septum here or by having one of, one of the reagents already dissolved in the liquid on the bottom. This, 
offers the opportunity to control the composition as a function of size. You know, so you can begin to grow one nanocrystal, one type of nanocrystal in the bottom, and then halfway through the growth, you can inject reagents to grow another nanocrystal through the septum and get core shell nanocrystals. Yes. All right. Here's an example of what you can make with time. Cartoon. We start with the reagents to make cadmium selenide in the center. Nucleation and growth, you stop at this size, and then you start injecting reagents to make cadmium sulfide. If the conditions are correct, you will not nucleate any new cadmium sulfide, but it will grow on the surface of the pre-existing cadmium selenide. And then you can continue by injecting at the final stage uh, zinc sulfide reagents, car carboxylic acid capping on the surface at the end of the reaction. This is useful because it keeps, you know, it's basically a piece of semiconductor surrounded by material with larger band gaps. Zinc sulfide is almost an insulator like that. So now let me talk in detail about how to, how to go through this and what we did. And for, for the young students in the audience, let me say this is, in fact, the way we gave talks in the 1980s. Before the, before the invention of PowerPoint, you, you see my handwriting, on, uh, handwriting cartoon effort to make sense of it all. Initially, we worked just in solution. My first experiments were done in aqueous precipitation, in aqueous solution, and uh, sometimes in alcohols, and sometimes at low temperature. And a problem with that is that particles, you'll have two particles that are growing, and they'll diffuse and touch each other, and they're reactive on their surfaces, so they'll fuse together to make a dumbbell-shaped particle. And pretty soon you have an aggregation you don't want that. You want to grow individual particles. So the first effort we made was to use inverse micelle solutions. This is like 1986, when Paul Olivasados first came to be a postdoc. Uh, inverse micelle solution, maybe 99% heptane and 1% water with some soap. And, and it's, there's a spontaneous phase separation into these little water droplets 50, 100 angstroms across in the heptane solution. Then the idea was to dissolve cadmium ions in the water, maybe five or 10, maybe just one. And this will be a tiny reagent ve vesicle that would allow you to grow one particle inside the micelle, and it would be protected against aggregation by the others by the soap structure. And so the second reagent, so we're going to precipitate cadmium selenide. Cadmium's dissolved in the water, bring in an organometallic reagent, uh, trimethylsilyl selenide, that will hydrolyze and grow to make a small particle. So that works. And you could, as Alexei was describing, you can follow this process by the change in the optical spectrum because the color is proportional to diameter. And I'll talk about that in a minute. You can make a solution like this. And then we figured out that you could control the growth. You know, so you could stop adding reagents. Uh, cadmium all used up. Uh, everything precipitated, let it sit for an hour, and then re add more reagents. And what you would find is if you added the reagents slowly, the pre-existing small particles would grow to be larger, but you would not nucleate any new, any new particles. So we had a system by which we could um, grow various sizes. You know, you start with this, and take the spectrum, make it a little, you know, add reagents, particles would grow larger. You could tell it was growing larger by the change in the optical absorption and the change in the fluorescence. And then we thought a little bit more about what to do with the surface. The surface 
of the one particle remains very reactive. Okay. When Munji came as a postdoc, after Paul went to uh, Berkeley as an assistant professor, uh, we figured out, and it was mainly Mike Steigerwald who was the driving force behind this, that we could change the nature of the surface of the particle. If you have, um, you have this growth process to make a particle, and then in the last stage you, you uh, eject phenyl trimethylsiloselenide. And that will react on the surface of the particle and put phenyl radicals on the surface of the particle. And in fact, that changes the particles from hydrophobic to hydro, um, hydro, hydrophilic to hydrophobic. Um, so while, while the particles, when, they're hydro, when they dissolve in the water, they stay in micellar solution. But as soon as you change the surface like this, put phenyl radicals on the surface, they uh, come out of the water and go into the heptane, and they're not very soluble in the heptane either. And so they fall to the bottom of the beaker, and you have pale yellow powder on the bottom of this solution. And then, so that means you can extract it, the particles out of the micellar solution, and you have a pure sample, dry sample of this material. And then we thought about this a little bit more. And in principle, the surface is, is bound, you know, the, the selenium atoms on the surface are bound to phenyl radicals. The cadmium atoms on the surfaces are bare, in principle. We wanted to do something with the surface, to passivate them even more. So the thought was to dissolve them in Lewis-based solvent. And the lone pairs on the solvent would, in fact, uh, coordinate, made a dative chemical bond to the cadmium atoms on the surface. So we did that. And the uh, first experiment actually was in pyridine, Refl and then refluxing in pyridine, and we realized that the particles were getting better when we refluxed them above room temperature. See, the weakness that we didn't understand in the beginning was all of this prior work was done at room temperature, but the growth is better at higher temperature. Here's an experiment where we re refluxed in tributylphosphine, tributylphosphine oxide at 230 centigrade for three hours. And it made larger particles, beautiful red solution uh, of uh, wurtzite structure. This was making zinc blend, this is making wurtzite. You don't need to understand the difference between these two structures. Anyway, there was a route found to better materials by working in Lewis space solvents at higher temperature. But this was not understood. This what was actually going on here. It's a recipe, f you know, for making larger particles, but it was, didn't work all the time. It was intermittent. And uh, it was obviously be controlled by some impurities, something we didn't have under control. Um, wasn't ready to publish by any means, but it was an exi existence proof that you could. You know, there was, nature had found some way to make better particles. This is the problem that Munji took to MIT when he went to be um, assistant professor, and you'll hear about all of this shortly. Bell Labs is a very collaborative institution, and you see we're able to do lots of characterization of these, of these materials, this one and that one as well. So this synthesis, chemical synthesis in solution, can, can work spectacularly well when it's optimized. Many people over the last 30 or 40 years have contributed to this improvement in the processing of the particles and invention of new routes to make different materials. And you see here some data from the laboratory of Chris Murray, who at that time was at IBM and who's in the audience today. This is making lead selenide nanocrystals. And you can see that um, perfect little cubes each one is a single nanocrystal. Uh, you see in this higher resolution image the lattice planes of the individual atoms. So again, this is just an evidence that you can make really good stuff if you optimize the synthesis. 
Synthesis is the critical part of all of this. And um, okay. So how was it that we could do this in Bell Labs uh, with enthusiasm? So Bell Labs was concerned with the future of, of computing and the future of microelectronics. And the main thing that was going on at that time, 1985, um, was the uh, miniaturization of transistors, not made by chemical means, but by photolithography. And this shows an old slide, uh, 45 nanometer size, 2000, year 2007, transistor on a chip like that, coming smaller and smaller and smaller on down. So the thing which, grow, which, uh, the thing which drove the industry was um, made computers better and cheaper, more powerful was this miniaturization. And so we were in, we were coming, and so, but what, that would have to change. When you, silicon has certain properties as a bulk material, when you get it small enough, as Alexei has, has been describing, its physical properties, the mobility of the electron, the optical properties would change and the transistor design would have to change accordingly to, accompany, to, take, to reflect the fact that the properties of the very small particles were different than the properties of the bulk material. So in our minds, we were doing long range basic research. Research of relevance to the future of the industry Relevance maybe in 10 years, 20 years out, who knows? And I looked up in preparation for this talk, the, the current status of these computer chips. And everyone has a cell phone. And uh, pulled this thing out and in here is a, a chip designed by Apple, the M1 chip. This chip has, it's hard to believe, but the truth is it has 110 billion transistors on one chip in an organized fashion to do computation. Can you imagine, you know, this after all this work by so many people over the decades, 110 billion transistors on one chip. So this now has pushed down into the regime that we were thinking about in the 1980s. You know, the truth is that this uh, transistor business is one of the great achievements of mankind, in my mind, you know. This uh, has improvement to communications, imp the improvement to computers has com completely changed the modern world, you know, compared with 50 years ago. A change as dramatic as the uh, improvement of DNA technology and for medicine and for doc clinical work. So we got into this accidentally, as many things happen in research. It wasn't our intention to look for quantum size effects in the beginning. I was doing experiments on the surface photochemistry of uh, semiconductor colloids. Colloidal particle can absorb one photon create an excited state, which is an electron hole pair. And uh, if you have an organic molecule on the surface, you can get oxidation or reduction reactions. Um, that experiment is best done in a colloid because the surface area is so high between the solvent and the surface of the solid material. So we had these old recipes, old recipes for, for making uh, colloids, and occasionally, uh, occasionally I would, uh, uh, I gotta get back to the right place here. Let's, occasionally we'd make a colloid, and the band gap was a little bit larger than the bulk band gap, and I didn't know why. And you can see that here. Um, this is the absorbance, optical absorption spectrum of uh, cadmium sulfide, in a bulk material, basically, it begins at 5,000 angstroms. You know, it absorbs light to the, to the blue of 5,000. You'd make a small particle solution. The absorption edge would shift, and uh, a little bump would appear. And the bump was, in fact, the beginning of an exciton. 
So this was evidence that we had, we had just as Alexei was describing, we had come into the, uh, we were by accident now getting small enough that we were intermediate or hybrid between molecular properties and solid state properties. We were in this intermediate regime. And so let's think a little bit about why and how that might be the case. Um, Alexei showed the um, equations for the quantum size effect which come from the band structure of the solid. Okay. I'd like to show an equivalent way of understanding that that's quantum size effect using the language of chemistry. And the key thing is that in a large crystal, a large silicon crystal, you have tetrahedral coordination, sp3 hybridization, silicon surrounded by four others in the, in the bulk. That's the same as in a small molecule. Here's a disilane molecule, sp3 hybridization, sigma sigma bond between two silicons and then capping on the surface by hydrogen atoms. Local chemical bonding around each silicon atom is the same in the molecule and the crystal. That's the key. And so here's the way to understand how this connects with the solid state. Uh, this little red dot is one silicon atom. And what energy is plotted on this scale. And across here is the size of the nanocrystal, of the number of silicon atoms in a nanocrystal. If you have the two silicon atoms, uh, disilane, Sigma bond formed between one silicon atom and the next, like that. Bonding orbital with two electrons in it and an anti-bonding orbital with no electrons in it. This is what we teach in freshman chemistry. All right, and so this splitting, sigma to sigma star, is the strength, basically a measure of the strength of the chemical bonding of the crystal. For diamond crystal, this splitting is really, really large. Um, Bonding is very strong. It, this, the splitting is different for every semiconductor. Now, suppose we get to the situation we have a really small um, silicon cluster that has maybe 10 or 15 of these bonds in it, like with capping on the surface. So you, you have, in fact, 10 sigma orbitals, 10, 10, anti -sigma, 10 sigma star orbitals, so these couple together and they, they, to make a, a, sh a narrow band of molecular orbitals like this, spreading out with the center of gravity with the original sigma orbital, many, many more states here, and uh, a width developing as a function of size. The mathematics of this width is known, you, you know, and that mathematics is, is, equi is equivalent to the, to the band structure equations that Alexei showed. So in molecular language, this is a molecule, big molecule. It's a homo and a lumo, and uh, optical transition from here to here. So as it grows larger, this, you have more and more states down here. They get closer and closer together. Eventually, they overlap with respect to their natural widths, and you form a band of occupied orbitals, which in the solid state language is the valence band. And there's a band up here of empty orbitals, the conduction band. And so you can see that the, in the asymptotic limit of a larger crystal, there's a band gap that controls the absorption. For, to, to the blue of this band gap, you know, it's absorbing at every wavelength and it's transparent to the red of this gap. Uh, this is the HOMO and the LUMO of the bulk crystal. This is the HOMO and the LUMO of the, of the nanocrystal. You can see just by this, the way the problem is set up symmetrically, this HOMO-LUMO transition is larger in the, in, in the crystal, the, sm the chemical quantum dot, than it is in the bulk material. So this energy difference between here and here is in fact the quantum size effect. And it means that the stability on a per atom basis in the, in, in the cluster is uh, less than in the bulk material. 
And the prediction is that in a, in a quantum dot, you have discrete molecular orbitals, although very close together. And so if the resolution is good enough, you can see these various transitions close to each other. So the continuous spectrum of the bulk material breaks up into a number of close, closely lying optical transitions. Looks like a molecule, like an aromatic hydrocarbon. You know, an aromatic hydrocarbon in solution might have a number of excited states um, that, you can, that, you can that you can resolve. Semiconductors luminous, and uh, you know when they're made well, when they're when they're crystalline, and you control the number of defects in them, they luminesce really well. The optical signals that are carried in optical fibers are made by little semiconductor lasers. Um, Christmas tree lights are now made by uh, light emitting diodes of semiconductors. And the laser pointer in here is. Uh, semiconductor based and it's true as well that the quantum dots will emit light very well if they're well made crystalline and the surface is the chemical valence on the surface is is taken is um, uh, corrected all right here we go there's another thing going on as I uh, it's a shame I don't have a good picture of that you have a quantum dot like this it has an electron and a hole in it, and the um, electric field lines begin on the hole and they terminate on the electron and they pass through the semiconductor mostly, but some of the electric field lines fringe out and then come back into the nanocrystal to terminate on the opposite charge. It's, and so that means the Coulomb attraction uh, depends on the, optic, on the dielectric constant of the solvent as well as the dielectric constant of the semiconductor. And so this is an attraction, uh, and it's a little bit stronger. Let me go to the next slide. If, if we drop back into the solid state language, this is the quantum size effect due to this incomplete band structure. Uh, and this is the Coulomb attraction between the electron and the hole. And so the, the, hom the, the homo to lumo transition occurs at this energy, uh, asymptotically coming into the bulk band gap, but shifting blue as a function of smaller diameter. It's a very simple model. It's approximately correct, but it, it has the virtue that there are no adjustable parameters in this. It's, um, based entirely on things which you can measure in the bulk, and then in zero order, you can use it to predict what the band gap will be of a particle of a certain size of that material. Effective masses and the dielectric constant are different for each material. Okay. So putting this all together, putting this all together, uh, we can recognize the spectroscopic regimes for uh, a quantum dot as it grows larger. If you have just maybe 10 atoms, it is a molecule in all respects, and the chemical bonding is different than in the bulk, has no relation to the bulk. But as it gets larger, the chemical bonding and the structure will shift into being an excised little fragment of the bulk, especially if you terminate the surface. And so in this size regime, you get these quantum dots that we're making through solution chemistry, you get to even larger. When you get to the diameter equal to the wavelength of light, then there's further changes in the spectra due to electromagnetic effects. There are also kinetic size regimes that I don't have time to talk about. And I just have one minute. So let me just give you, I'll give you uh, what else is going on in, in nanoscience with respect to the electrons. So. Uh, what are the electrons doing? Um, when you think about this inner side, intermediate size regime, there are a number of things which happen which are not characteristic either of molecules or the bulk material. One is this uh, quantum size effect that I've been talking about. That's a single electron property quantum, shown by quantum dots. There's strong electron correlation. Um, 
This is single electron property. This is a multi-electron property. For example, if you have electrons want to avoid colliding with each other, they all have the same charge. So in a bulk material, if one electron is coming like this and the other electron is coming like this, they're heading towards each other, one can turn up and the other can turn down and avoid each other. So that, that this process of avoiding each other is a very strong function of dimensionality of the material. It's much harder to avoid the collision in two dimensions and especially hard in one dimension. And this can be shown uh, in uh, excitons and carbon, well, in, yeah, let me go back and get it to the right place. In a carbon nanotube short, you know, you can make an excited state, electro absorb a photon, make an excited state. Carbon nanotube is fundamentally different than a nanocrystal because it has one dimension which is, which is still long, like this. So an electron in the carbon nanotube, if the electron is going around the circumference, it comes back on itself and it has to show positive interference to make a stationary state. And uh, that's the same thing as in a nanocrystal. You can think of it in a nanocrystal, electron is going, uh, bounces off the wall, comes back into the interior of the nanocrystal, has to interfere with itself constructively rather than destructively. This is a little bit like Bohr's original model for the hydrogen atom. Bohr's model was that electrons are going around in orbits and there has to be an integral number of wavelengths, the Broglie wavelengths going around and um, to make a stationary state. So 1s, 2s, 1p, 2p, all these were stationary states in Bohr's model. Well, all right, so since the time is up, let me just go ahead and try to bring this to a conclusion. There's strong screening as well. If you think about, you know, a carbon nanotube has electrons right on the surface. And so the, the field, if you create an electron hole pair, the electric field will come out, pushing the wrong button, electric field will come out and partially go into the solvent and then come back again to the opposite charge in the nanotube. So that's, this is, um, it senses the properties of the solvent. The excited state senses the properties of a solvent. That's basically a molecular property. A bulk solid state material, um, everything happens inside. The surface is not relevant for a big crystal. This is behaving more like a molecule. All right, I'll we'll skip this one and skip this comparison. Conclusion, in, carbon, in, in nanocrystals, the size dependence of the electrical and operative properties result from simple quantum confinement uh, with relatively little electron correlation. Nanocrystals are in fact excellent classes of large molecules and excellent chromophores if in fact you can make them well, and the structure is annealed. The carbon nanotubes are superb wires. In nanoscience, you can see from what I've said and what Alexei has said that synthesis is a critical technology. You can theorize all day long about this, but what you actually, what is important is to make them and actually study what properties they have rather than just think about it abstractly. All right. So I'm profoundly grateful to the Nobel Foundation for this honor, as I said. Also profoundly grateful to my family for support over the decades, to my wife, Marilyn, three children, and now four grandchildren, all of whom are here in the meeting today. The essence of making progress in, originally in Bell Labs was through collaboration. Tim Harris, Mike Steigerwald, Bill Wilson, Munji, Paul, Jay Troutman, Sasha Efros, for um, all these different aspects of putting the problem together. You can see this problem is partly theory, partly organic chemistry, organometallic chemistry, uh, material science. You need expertise in all these areas. Um, going back to what I said about Bell Labs, 
you know, I'm lucky to have been there when this project started because it was the kind of institution that could support this strong collaboration and which understood the importance of this on the 10 or 20 year scale. There was no work of this sort in American universities at that time. Nobody was thinking about this problem. If I had gone to the NSF and asked them for money, um, it wouldn't have worked. You know, nobody else would think this was important. All right. Last slide. I think I was in Hong Kong maybe 10 years ago and had to overnight to, um, put together to give some thoughts to a, a room full of high school students about this size, about what they should be thinking about in doing research. And so this is what I came up, up with. We're all trapped by our educational backgrounds. You, you come out of school knowing a certain field. You don't know anything about other fields of science. Um, that limits what you can do, for sure. And the way to, the way to combat this is every day learn something new. I tell my grad students that the greatest skill they have is to continue to learn by themselves after they have left graduate school. Most of the things that I have used in my life were invented after I left graduate school. And I had to keep learning just to keep up with the field. Why are your, what, is your, what are your colleagues working on and why do they think it's important? Search continuously for a better problem than the one you're working on at present. Choice of the problem is the most important scientific decision you will ever make. You know, so if you're a competent scientist and someone gives you a well-defined problem, you probably can work it out. The hard thing is to figure out what to do in the beginning if someone doesn't give you the problem. That means to recognize where there's opportunity that other people don't see yet, you know. Problems that are difficult in one field can be easy in other fields. And the last thing is certainly true. You don't have to be a genius to make good progress. You have to be dedicated, be intelligent, and have discipline to keep working, but not be a true genius. So I tried to tell you a little bit of this, and we only got through part of it. And I thank you for your attention today. quantum dots to technical applications and everyday applications like we see them today, a method was required that would enable the production or the manufacturing of quantum dots with very high quality and in a scale, in, in a way that allowed it upscaling into industrial scale. Such a method was invented by, by Professor Munji Bawendi, who is a native of France. Uh, received his PhD in 1988 from the University of Chicago and is today a professor at MIT. Please welcome Professor Munji Bawendi for his Nobel Prize lecture. I want to uh, start by thanking the uh, Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and the Nobel Committee for uh, chemistry and the Nobel Foundation for this incredible honor of being here in front of you. Um, as was explained in the last two talks, quantum confinement is key to understanding the properties of, of, of these semiconductor nanoparticles, these quantum dots. And what you see here on the screen is a series of vials of different sizes dots that are emitting at different light uh, frequencies. And at a basic level, you can think of quantum mechanics being the important property that the electrons acquire at the small size scale. When you think of an electron in a circuit, you think of a small particle moving around. 
with the velocity, etc. When you try to stuff an electron in a small box, like a small nanoparticle, that electron can no longer be described as a, as a, as a little piece, as a little particle moving in the circuit. It can only be described through the laws of quantum mechanics. It becomes a wave. And as you know, when you have a wave in a, uh, for instance, in an organ pipe or in a flute, that the size of the wave depends on the boundary. So a small organ pipe have a, has a smaller wave in it, a sound wave, than a big organ pipe. And it's that effective idea that happens here with the electron and the quantum dot. And that change in the wavelength of the electron eventually gets translated in a change in the wavelength of the light that is emitted by the particles. So the red particles have a longer wavelength and the small particles have a shorter wavelength. I want to uh, start off with my timeline from my time at Bell Labs to uh, my time at uh, MIT, where we ended up uh, creating this synthesis that is recognized by the Nobel Prize Committee in 1993. I want to thank especially the uh, students that were with me at the time, Chris Murray, David Norris, Manoj Nirmal. It took an adventurous group to join a young assistant professor on, on his journey at the time. So let me start with uh, the Bell Labs prep that uh, Lewis talked about, what I will call the phosphine prep. At the end of 1989, I was a postdoc, and I stumbled into that. Um, the phosphine prep, and I have my slides also from 1990, etc., cetera, on transparencies. Uh, the micelle prep, it should be called the inverse micelle prep, Stargewald, Oliver Saros, and Bruce de developed that before I came as a, as, as a postdoc, basically creating little, in, uh, little droplets of water and making the reaction at room temperature in these droplets of water to uh, eventually create a small powder of particles. And what they had found that by annealing the particles at, uh, for instance, in a Lewis space like 4 ethyl pyridine at 160 degrees, uh, you could make better particles. The water amount regulated the particle size. So uh, what they had found that by uh, boiling in pyridine, um, these particles, sometimes they found this very interesting uh, transition, this very sharp peak in the optical spectrum around 410 nanometers. And my job was to try to figure out what was that. And I really didn't know any chemistry. And really, Mike Stargewald, who is here today, uh, taught me everything I know about organic metal organometallic chemistry. I was a theorist first, and then I became a spectroscopist. And then, through an accident of time and space, I ended up at Bell Labs working with Lewis, who really taught me how to be a scientist. So um, I didn't know what a Lewis space was, so I asked my, Mike, you know, what is a Lewis space? <laughs> and uh, Mike showed me a bunch of Lewis spaces in his lab, so I took a bunch of these things, and I started cooking the particles and whatever I could find. And for most of them, nothing much happened, but it, there happened to be a bottle of uh, tributyl phosphine where some magic happened. And you can see the word magic on this slide. You don't see that very often in, uh, in, uh, in a scientific talk. It was because we really didn't understand much more what was going on. But what we found was that uh, these particles grew uh, and changed color. And at the end of the process, uh, we obtained uh, this amazing sample, much better than we had seen before. Um, and I wrote a paper on this called the X-ray structural characterization of larger cat selenide particles. And this is the experimental section. And you see underlined in red the words occasionally. You know, uh, that was part of the magic. Um, so occasionally a red color appeared. Um, what we had created was a material that had a much better crystalline structure than before. The optical properties were, was much better. So as you go down the side here, you see this very broad looking thing uh, on top. And as you go and anneal at higher temperatures, eventually coming to this phosphine prep, you start seeing the, the appearance of structure in the spectrum. That showed that the particles were getting better. We took, did x-ray uh, uh, analysis. And the, the width of the peaks that you see on top are, are an indication of the coherent size of the crystal that's in it. So broad peaks means that the material is mostly amorphous, and uh, sharper peaks means that it's more crystalline. And so as you see that, as you lean out higher temperature, the crystallinity also increased. The uh, going to low temperature is also of something that we do quite a bit. This is at 15 Kelvin, uh, because uh, at room temperature, your um, 
analysis of what's going on is, is hampered by thermal noise. Things get broadened down by thermal noise, which you can uh, eliminate by going to low temperature. And what we found was this sharpening of the, of the spectrum, indicating that we could now see really the, uh, the size distribution was getting much narrower, and we could really see this, this wave, the electron wave, this exciton, being very well defined in the particles. And most importantly, in the lower uh, uh, left-hand side here, you see by doing... Um, by combining this really beautiful sample with um, an optical method which selects the biggest particles in the sample, we could see the very sharp structure of vibrations of the, of the, of the, of the atoms inside the particle. That showed us that we had finally found something that was really quite crystalline of the quality that we were after. But the problem is that I could only make one size. And if you're trying to understand the size evolution of material from molecules to the bulk, and you've only got one size, you, you don't really have what you need. And so that's when I come to MIT. We tried to reproduce this with Chris Murray and David Norris, um, taking little seeds of, uh, of these water-based uh, materials and growing them in, in, in the phosphine and quickly realized that, you know, this irreproducibility was a huge problem, the lack of size was a huge problem, and within a few months, uh, Chris Murray uh, uh, and, and I, you know, thinking about the, the nucleation and growth of, the, um, of, of making crystals back in the, uh, back in the 1950s, uh, which is what, really what I had been using when taking little seeds that were water-based and dissolving them and growing them further, um, so we got rid of all the water-based part, and we switched completely entirely to uh, organic, air-free-based organometallic chemistry. And instead of making little seeds in water, we developed a process called the hot injection method, which is what people call it now, um, where we introduced uh, the, um, the... And this is a picture of Chris and David from that time here, we introduced the, 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 um, the precursors uh, rapidly through uh, a syringe here into a hot uh, solvent that contains the, the surface molecules that, that, uh, that, that uh, um, slow down the growth and, and provide a, a uniform surface of the particles. Okay, once we did that, you know, that was all good, but uh, still the quality wasn't good enough. You could tell from the optical spectrum that these peak that we were looking for were not getting sharp enough. The distributions were still within maybe a bigger than 10% uh, distribution. And my goal was nearly defect-free particles, a size series, a consistent surface chemistry, and especially a narrow size distribution. Because we really wanted to study the physics, the physics of this evolution. And without a sample, we didn't have anything, and it was kind of scary at the beginning. You know, I start off, I want to do all, this, all these experiments, and I need a sample, right? We need our samples. And so that was really the, 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 uh, the issue, the, 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 uh, uh, the necessity of the samples which drove us towards working very hard, Chris, towards, towards Chris and David and I to work very hard to, to figure out how to do this. And, um, Chris was working in the lab, and David was, you know, getting his, his physics experiment ready, so as was Manoj Nemal, the, the third student of, of, my, of, my, of my initial group. Um, and uh, also, these uh, initial molecules we were using were very expensive. They were little bottles, and they were costing hundreds of dollars a piece. We were running through that really quickly. Um, and we realized then um, uh, that, uh, you know, the temperature needed to be higher, perhaps, and we needed something cheaper. And so we found this uh, octal-based uh, tributyl phosphine octal, which is a longer chain, which has a higher boiling point, which happens to be used in the uh, mining of uranium. So it's based, it's made in the, in the train load. It's super cheap. And so that was great. And so it had the advantage of, of having a higher temperature, at much higher, uh, 300 degrees or higher. And as a result, when we switched, we were able to get a bigger sizes, get our size series, um, and then finally, um, adding to that, as because we're chemists, we think that at the end of the process, we have to purify our material, and uh, uh, ended up having uh, what we call size selective pur purification. This is a slide from, from that period also. Um, 
now I have a laser printer, so it's not all handwritten. Um, crystallinity, high temperature, uniform surface, all the same molecule. The idea of Lemaire from the 1950s of separating the nucleation and growth, as Alexi was talking about. You nucleate little seeds and you grow on the top of them to get uniform size distribution and you end up with, um, with uh, uniform particles, which you can extract with uh, solvents. I have a video here of what the process actually looks like. Um, so there's the, uh, the syringe here. Uh, there's the flask, which is at around 300 degrees Celsius or so. And uh, the injection followed by the nucleation, immediate change in color. And now we're gonna, we're gonna have a gap in the time here because we don't wanna spend three hours here waiting for the particles to grow. Uh, he's, uh, uh, the student here is uh, taking samples out and you can see the, 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 the color changing as he takes the samples out. So we've, we've had a gap in the time now. The color is much deeper red. Uh, there are much bigger particles. And um, uh, let me, uh, you can see now the, the change in color as the particles grow from orange to red. And let me speed it up to the end here. And then when you shine light, UV light on them, you can see that they're emitting at different colors. So we have our size series. We have our size series. And we wrote this paper, this 93 paper that is cited by the Nobel Committee. It was a simple route. It was scalable. And that was important for the future for manufacturability. Uh, it gave us high quality. It had a consistent crystal structure. Uh, it was a single, a, sim, uh, a single step process. And if you think about manufacturing, the cost of manufacturing is basically scales by the number of steps that you need to make. So this, this was quite important. And then the last part with the purification, the size selective precipitation, which uh, by taking a, a bad solvent or a poor solvent into the solution, uh, the, pirate, the biggest particles uh, uh, have the strongest attraction. They will come out of the solution first and you can get rid of those. And you, so you cut off the tail here. You're left with a, uh, a solution that has a, uh, that, that where the bigger particles are taken out. You can do it again and take out the small particles and are left with a very, very narrow size distribution. And you can see the result of that in a TM here. Uh, electron microscope, um, uh, transmission electron microscope image. You can see that they're really all the same size. This is from that paper here. You do the x-ray uh, analysis. The, sh the solid line is the theoretical expectation for a particle of that size with pure, as a pure crystal. And we see that we match theory quite well. And now we have this beautiful absorption spectrum. So this, this peak here, that was that first, this is basically the electron wave filling up uh, the, you know, the particle. And then the other peaks you can think of are harmonics. You know, like in, uh, in music, you have the, you can hear the harmonics of that at a different scale. So these are basically harmonics of that waves here. So that was the first indication that we could see the excited harmonics of the particle. And the emission was now extremely narrow, much narrower than before, right at the edge here, and, and, quite, and much brighter than before, around 20% or 30% uh, what we call the quantum yield, which is the ratio of the photons that come out to the ratio to the photons that we put into the material. 100% is the best that you can do. And the exquisite tunability that Chris Murray was able to, uh, to do with this synthesis here is shown here. So this is a size series and you can see the change in the color. This is 400 nanometers is blue, 700 is quite red. And you see the change in color so the difference between any of these two is basically a handful of atoms, a handful of atoms that give you this huge change. In, and then uh, as you, you, if you look at a blow up of a few of the ones on, the, on, on my left here, you can see these harmonics being shown very nicely. Okay, so this is where David comes in now with his physics experiment because now we're ready to really understand this evolution. And the first thing that you do is you go to low temperature again, and then you, you incorporate optical experiments where you can select even further the sizes of the particles to study them. And, um, uh, and whereas at room temperature here, you can see the harmonics sort of spreading out as you get to a uh, higher and higher pitch. When you actually do the experiments, you see that it's more, com more complicated than that. And the reason it's more complicated is because these are not empty boxes. These are boxes that have atoms in them. And these elect that electron wave interacts with those atoms. And so you see interesting things like 
you see that the harmonics here wants to go get uh, higher pitched, but then it gets repelled by another harmonic here. In spectroscopy, we call that an avoided crossing. And when spectroscopists or physicists see avoided crossing, their hearts swoon because this is, this is what we live for sometimes, right? And so this means that we are really studying the physics of the material, not the physics of an amorphous material or the physics of defects. Because when you start in this field, you're always worried, am I really studying the real thing or just defects? And nobody really wants to study defects at this stage. Uh, Manoj, pictured here, uh, was ready to do magnetic experiments. And the theorist, Sasha Efros, who's here as well, who guided us through this period uh, with his intuition, and uh, um, the theorist predicted that the emission from uh, the light that would come out um, would be what's called forbidden, at, uh, meaning that it would take a very long time for that electron to go back to the ground state to find its, to find its home. Uh, and so the light would take a long time to come out of the particles. But in the presence of a magnetic field, it would shorten, the magnetic field would shorten that time. And that's exactly what we found here. This is time on this axis. This is the amount of time that the light comes out. With the field off, it's longer than with the field on. That was another, um, another indication that what we were really studying was the, was the real physics, and that our samples had gotten as good as we could make them, and certainly well enough to, to study the physics. Okay, now you've got these beautiful particles and they behave a little bit like artificial atoms. You know, you create these electrons and they're waves, the waves that you can change the size. And uh, what we had found initially in, this, in these initial pictures was that they tended to want to, um, to, uh, to assemble in a well-defined manner. And it turns out that if you're very careful, you can essentially create super crystals out of them. You can create supercrystals of artificial atoms. And this is an image from uh, a paper by Sherry Kagan, Chris Murray, and myself, uh, showing the beginning of the assembly process here. Or the, uh, of, this is now a field that has taken off. He is creating interesting crystals out of these supercrystals out of artificial atoms like this. And in, the, in a, uh, an SEM surface electron microscopy, uh, microscope, you can see the individual dots here assembling into these bigger and bigger crystals, eventually making macro macroscopic crystal. And this is a picture of Sherry from the early 90s working on this. And so when you do that, then suddenly you think about, okay, maybe we can give really new and interesting properties to these crystals of artificial atoms. You know, the normal crystals made out of normal atoms look nothing like the atoms they're made up with. You, you, can make you can make semiconductors, you can make metals, you can look at transport properties. And so this is what, uh, what we were thinking about. You know, how, could, how can we now use these particles as a new periodic table and make new materials? And uh, there's a huge field uh, working on that now, and Sherry and Chris are still working on this area now uh, with beautiful, beautiful results. Okay, I want now to spend... Um, uh, okay, this is a picture from 1998 that shows the, the characters of the story. There's Sherry, there's Chris, there's David Norris as myself, Sasha Afros, a theorist, Tim Harris, who was at Bell at the time, who will come in my story very briefly uh, in a minute, and Manoj Nirmal on the side here. Okay, a big improvement, uh, a step towards the, the, the commercialization of the material was this realizing that, uh, that you could keep adding new materials on the surface of, this, of these growing particles. Um, and there was a series of papers in the uh, mid-1990s, Mar uh, Margaret Hines and Gio Philippe Guillaume uh, showed us that, um, that uh, you know, you could get quantum yields uh, as high as 50%. So there was an improvement of what we did, better stability, and a bunch of, uh, a bunch of us uh, worked in that area at the same time. Giving us these beautiful colored vials, emissive, and when you have uh, tunable colors that are bright, that can all be created using a simple blue light, you start to think, how can I use this thing for? This is kind of an amazing new material. What can I do, what can I do with it? And this is where the application started. Um, the first use for them was not a real commercial application. It was the, the realization that these things were now very stable and good enough that we can actually see them one at a time. And when you see them one at a time, you discovered a wonderful new world. For instance, you discovered that 
that uh, these things are like stars. They blink on and off, and we have to try to understand that. You discover that um, you can actually go and look at the spectrum, look at uh, of these materials, and you see that as you cool down, that they're all, they're all different. They all have different spectra, but they're very, very narrow. You can see that here on the this, on this scale here. And that has um, been, uh, you look at the dynamics, you see all sorts of new dynamics that you didn't expect. This is the, this is the, you know, the exploration of science. You, you, you find a new material and you do experiments, you find things you didn't expect. So we saw this is energy on the scale as a function of time. You see a jumps. So basically, these, these little particles become sensors of their environment. They're not isolated. They live in a matrix where there are electrons that are moving around, the electric fields that are moving around. And so all these jumps that we see are due to charging or um, uh, of the particle itself, charging of the surface, or local charge dynamics. Eventually, we figured out how to make the particles so that they were less uh, sensitive to the environment, more stable. And recently, that has allowed us to uh, apply these materials, to begin to apply them in, in quantum optics. And what you see here is the, a, a recent result uh, showing what is called fo two-photon coalescence. So if you can get uh, photons coming from these particles that are indistinguishable, that look alike in every possible way, and you put them on a beam splitter here, one coming from the bottom, one coming from the right, from the left here, instead of coming out in stochastic way, they will always come out together. And this coalescence is a, is a hallmark of what we need, what, what, what is important to, towards making um, a quantum communication and quantum computers uh, optically. I talked about uh, particles as building blocks. I want to show you one example of uh, super nanoparticles. Um, this is combining quantum dots here, semiconductors, with magnetic particles to create these super particles now that are even bigger. So this is the building block idea. Um, these super particles are made up of luminescent quantum dots and magnetic little particles, and so they react to a magnetic field by being attracted to it. So they're both emissive and magnetic. Uh, you can, they end up being these little core shells where the, the emissive particles are on the, on the surface and the magnetic particles on the inside. And so you see this beautiful order happening when you have particles that are really all the same size, really like atoms. When you put them together, they, be, they can order in really interesting ways. And you can see the, 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 the chemical analysis on the bottom. The first application happened in, um, in uh, the uh, uh, late... Uh, 1990s in, medical Im in biomedical imaging, cell labeling. And there was a company that was created uh, to commercialize that, and they did an amazing, uh, uh, really pioneer work, work on that. And you can see here a cell labeled with quantum dots in the nucleus and dyes on the outside, and the, uh, the, the, the dye bleaching out and disappearing as the quantum dots survived because they're little pieces, pieces of rock. Uh, we did a bunch of in vivo experiments and showed that by choosing the surface ligands correctly, then we were able to make these things biocompatible. So in green here, you have uh, the, the vessels of, uh, in, in this image here, and then we inject quantum dots, and you can see them sort of getting out of vessels into the tissue without aggregating. And so this uh, then has led to, uh, to a whole bunch of, of uh, studies of using the quantum dots to understand the, the tumor uh, microenvironment, for instance. Uh, this is an image of uh, using quantum dots to, to double label cells in vivo. These are uh, hemo hematopoietic precursor cells uh, using intravital two-photon microscopy, and you take two colors, red and green, and only those cells have receptors on their surface that can bind to these two colors, and the final color is, uh, is blue, which labels the, the nucleus of normal cells, uh, but not the, those of those uh, basically stem cells. And so now when you go uh, with a microscope and you look for yellow, which is the combination of red and green, you see this one cell here, which is the, 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 the cell that you're trying to study, and you want to study its microenvironment to see how it survives in, in, uh, in, in the bone marrow, in this case here. Color downshifting. This is basically what color downshifting is it, in, in the previous slide. It's taking the blue color and creating new colors out of it. And this was... This is the big application. 
Uh, there were two companies that were uh, pioneers in this, Nanosys and QD Vision. The first commercial product was uh, using LED light, and which at the time was too blue, and incorporating a little bit more red in it, uh, using a quantum dot film on top. Uh, uh, that came out in 2010. Um, it's a little too complicated for a light bulb, which doesn't cost too much money. So that turns out not to be a great uh, commercial success. Uh, but people are still working in that area to make the color of LEDs uh, uh, more acceptable. Uh, but the application that turned out to have legs is in displays. Uh, because the gallium nitride blue diodes were invented and were being used to create the light in, in displays. The first television was a Sony television based on cadmium selenide. Then uh, Samsung um, introduced indium phosphide quantum dots, and now a lot of these displays, which they call QLED, are based on using gallium nitride blue uh, emissive diodes, and then uh, green and red LEDs, uh, uh, quantum dots, to create the, the, the panoply. It gives you displays that are less energy intensive with, uh, with better colors. Um, I'm going to... Uh, skip this last slide, this last uh, application, and go directly to, the, um, to, to my concluding remarks here. So at the beginning, we were interested in, in quantum dots of semiconductors. The process that we invented, uh, that Chris Murray invented, uh, along with David Norris in my lab, uh, can be applied to many other materials. Can be applied to metals, semi-metals, magnetic materials, ferroelectrics, oxides, etc. The process of assembling these particles into these artificial solids, you can combine now all these materials together. And you can think then of what the future could be if you combine a magnetic material with a, a semiconductor and a metal material in an organized way and combine those properties together and create new things. And that's what the excitement is. You know, you, we're creating new things. We're not quite sure what it, where it's going to go but we know that something interesting is going to come out. Over the course of the last 30 years, people, by adding different kinds of ligands, have figured out how to make spheres and cubes and rods and platelets, make them heli helical like DNA, chiral, handedness with handedness. These assemblies can also incorporate organic materials. So we have now a, a new world, this new nano world of material which we can try kind of like a, really like a periodic table, which we can begin to assemble and see what new properties come out. The applications, I showed you light emission applications in displays in the biomedical area. Solar energy is another big one that people are working on. The catalysis and photocatalysis, this is where it started with Lou Bruce at Bell Labs. There's still a, a, a huge uh, amount of work going on there and a lot of progress. And I think the future in bright, is bright in that area. Electronics, optics, computer sy uh, quantum system, you name it. The, the field has, has grown exponentially. And the more people you have working there, really bright people, the more likely we are to come with applications that are going to change the way that we, that we uh, look at uh, the world around us, that we live as the displays have. Now, funding is a really important part of the work that we do, and we wouldn't be able to do that without funding from both government sources, foundations, and private companies. It's not enough to have government funding. You need to have a mixture of both, of all three in this world. And finally, I want to thank especially the students that did this work. The students are the heroes here. They're the ones that actually are in the lab doing the work every day and accomplishing uh, these miracles. And I thank you.